Hey, family. My name is Cam. Welcome to Kaimuki Christian Church Online. Thank you so much for joining us. A few things before we get started. We would love it if you were to participate in our online chat. However, if that is too distracting for you, that is a okay. We have the notes tab for you, which is going to have notes for our sermon today from Pastor Jerry, and you can follow along on those notes, or you can click the Bible tab, and you can follow along in the Bible, which is also an amazing thing. So, wherever you are, whatever time zone you're in, we're so glad that you're here with us, and let's get started with some worship through music. In Psalm 28, verse 7, it says, The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him and he helps me. My heart leaps for joy, and with my song I praise him. So we're going to praise him today. We're going to raise a hallelujah in this place, wherever you are, at home, in your car. We're going to raise a hallelujah to the Lord because he's good. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah.
Open our eyes to see the things that make your heart cry, to be the church that you would desire, a light to be seen. down our pride and all the walls we build up inside our earthly crowns and all our desires we lay at your feet let hope rise and dark tremble in your holy light that every eye will see Jesus our God great and mighty to be praised God of all days glorious in all of the majesty, the wonders and grace, the light of your name. Sing, let hope, let hope rise, and darkness tremble in your holy light, that every eye will see.
give you praise. We give you glory. We honor you. We thank you so much for our lives. We thank you that you created us, that we get to be a part of this beautiful world, this amazing universe, Lord. We just give all that we have to you right now, Lord. We lay it at your feet and we say, you are holy, you are God. We are not. We thank you that you love us like your own children. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, welcome. Uh, Pastor Jerry here, and we're so glad that you have joined us for worship today at Kamiki Christian Church. Hey, why don't we begin with a word of prayer? Would you bow your heads and hearts with me? Dear God, we thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to learn more about you, to grow in your grace and knowledge. Lord, we thank you for your word, the Bible, and for your Holy Spirit. We pray that you would Build us up today, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, have you ever been in a situation that you felt like there was just no way out at all? Maybe it was a report from the doctor that you got. Maybe it was some kind of a financial catastrophe. Maybe your marriage was unraveling. Maybe you had a teenage son or daughter that was off the rails. Or maybe you had a loved one die. You know, in situations like that, where we feel like we're at a dead end, uh, it's tough. And yet there are lots of lessons in the Bible that are for us today, even though maybe some of these events have occurred actually centuries ago. We're going to look at one such event today from the book of Exodus in the Old Testament. Yes, that's right, Exodus was actually a book in your Old Testament, so blow the dust off of it or boot up your Bible app today and turn to Exodus chapter 14. You know, in this uh, story in the book of Exodus, uh, it's a pretty much a dead-end kind of a situation for the people of Israel. You might remember that they had been freed from slavery they had been in slavery for 400 years, but through a series of amazing miracles, God delivered them and set them free. But here they were in this story, and they found themselves trapped between the proverbial rock and a hard place. But in this case, it was between the world's mightiest army, the Egyptian army, and an impassable body of water called the Red Sea which is, of course, still there today. You know, the miraculous crossing of the Red Sea so many centuries ago is an epic account of how God intervened in the life of his people when they had no way out, no other alternatives. In spite of those overwhelming circumstances, they saw God do amazing things that they talked about and, in fact, still talk about to this day. What do you do when you don't know what to do? Well, we're gonna talk about that today. So I wanna encourage you uh, to follow along with me. Uh, there's a, uh, an outline of the uh, sermon points that I'm gonna make, make four points today. So it's on uh, you know, the, uh, the, the screen there. You can tap onto that and access that today. So here's the first point. If you want to know what to do and you don't know what to do, the first thing you need to do is to follow God's directions. You know, when Pharaoh, the king or emperor, whatever you want to call him, of Egypt had let the Israelite people go, 
God actually did not lead them on the main road through the desert to what was in those days known as Canaan or what we would come to call it, which is the promised land. He would have had to have led them through dangerous territory, which they didn't really know about. It was occupied by the Philistines who became their kind of perennial enemy uh, as the Old Testament kind of progressed. Even though that was the shortest route, though, though, that's not what God did. Instead, God then led in, he led them, excuse me, in a kind of a roundabout way through the wilderness towards the Red Sea. Now, it is kind of interesting because the Bible makes it plain that the Lord gave them kind of a special GPS system. He gave them, you know, a fire by night, a pillar of cloud by day to guide them. It was really, really simple. When the cloud moved, they moved. Uh, when it stopped, they stopped. Uh, the cloud gave them protection over the hot desert sun during the day, which can and still does get up to like 120. Uh, and so you can die. I mean, remember, there, the, the, there were millions of people that were in this march out of Egypt uh, going there. They had kids, they had older people. Uh, they needed protection. God provided that cloud during the day and a fire by night because the desert is a place of great extremes. And uh, it would get cold at night. Having that fire would not only, again, give them warmth, but actually give them some light and protect them along the way. The thing is, is that in spite of all this, God had led them in this path that took them to basically what we'd call a huge beach. On the PowerPoint, you'll see some pictures. One is a kind of a, a, a Google Earth kind of a photo of what the, uh, the area known as Egypt today and then where the Red Sea was leading to what's called the Promised Land. The Israelites lived in an area called Goshen and then they had to travel down through there and then cut across some area into a place called Sukkoth and then they headed to this particular region which uh, it, Today, they'd call it a wadi. You know, that's what the Arabic-speaking people would call it, a wadi. It was kind of like a, we'd call it a canyon, where they would go through and they had mountains on either side, but it led through this winding kind of a thing, and it ended up on this big beachhead. Now, I mean, if you were just going to take a holiday or something like that, that'd be a cool place to be. The problem is, when they got there, they realized there was no way out. They were in basically a cul-de-sac. They had gone through this narrow, winding canyon with mountains on either sides, and they were stuck there on the beach. And so they were waiting for further information. But they were trapped. You know, there are times in life when we come to places when we feel trapped, too. Have you ever noticed how uncanny it is that when you really decide to get serious about your walk with God, that sometimes you find yourself in situations that appear to be a dead end, like there's no way out? Like, how did I get here? You know, you, you can experience a, a lot of joy and peace and so forth, and yet you feel like I'm following you, Lord, but then why am I in this place? Why am I in this particular situation? You know, this story shows, among other things, that things are not always as they seem to be. But when I'm in those kind of times in my own life, I'm tempted to wonder whether or not God has actually given me correct directions or not. I feel like it's like, what? You know, I, I booted up my app, I did it, and it's like I get to that thing and I'm in a cul-de-sac and it's like the ladies with the nice voice is saying, recalculating. And I feel like that sometimes with God. Have you ever experienced that? You know, today, we actually as Christians have something much better than a cloud and a pillar of fire. We have, number one, the Bible, which is God's word to us. And we also have the Holy Spirit, which is far better than what these people in the Old Testament had. You know, the Bible is the word of God. It, just, it doesn't just contain God's word, as some would suggest. It is God's word. And it's able 
to teach us, to instruct us, to correct us, to rebuke us when we need, us, need it, and to train us in ways of righteousness. I like how the psalmist put it in Psalm 119, verse 105. He said, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. But you know, Jesus also promised that he would not leave us like orphans. He was talking to, of course, his 12 disciples, well, really 11, because Judas had taken off. But he was talking to them on the night that he was going to be betrayed, and he said, hey, guys, I know you're sad that I'm going to be going. It's my paraphrase. But he was saying, don't worry. I'm going to send you a counselor, a comforter, someone to come alongside and help you even the Holy Spirit. This, the, the, these are the verses from John 14, beginning in verse 18. It says, The Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Then he went on to say, When he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he'll guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what's yet to come. You know, when you don't know what to do, the first thing is follow God's directions. Now, all the men that are watching today, you don't have to show your hands, but, but you do have to be honest here. How many of you like to ask for directions? No hands? Okay, so you're like me, okay? I have to admit it. I hate asking for directions because I'm still figuring it out, right? But usually when I don't ask directions and I think, okay, I got this, but I don't, <laughs> usually, number one, things take way longer than they should. And I have to admit that I was stubborn and wrong. But you know, part of the Christian life, too, in terms of following directions, sometimes comes not just from the Bible and from the Holy Spirit, but it, come, it can come from other godly Christians around you. If you're, you know, still living at home with your parents, maybe you're a teenager, hey, sometimes it's your parents that can actually speak the right directions to you, believe it or not, okay? Other times it can be your spouse, yes, your spouse, okay, that can speak things and you need to listen, guys. Notice I didn't say gals, but it can go both ways, okay? But you know, God isn't withholding information from us. He isn't holding back on us. He wants to communicate to us. The question is, are we paying attention? Are we following his directions? But besides that, the second point is this. We need to remember God's power. You know, in this account here in the book of Exodus, when the people realized they had no way out, they panicked. But listen, listen to this in chapter 14, beginning in verse 11. They said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Now, it is true that the people also, this passage tells us, cried out to the Lord, which is the right thing to do. That's praying, okay? When you cry out to the Lord, it's always a good thing. But very quickly, uh, their tune changed because they began to blame Moses as if he was the one that had brought them there to die out there in the barren wilderness. They saw the Egyptian army coming up. They saw the Red Sea in front of them. And by the way, they had no boats. They had no choppers coming to the rescue, no Navy SEAL teams, nothing, okay? They were stuck. And you know what? They felt terrified. You know, if you think about it, there are different kinds of fears. There's rational fear and there's irrational fear. In this case, most of their fear was probably rational. They were terrified. They didn't know what to do. These were not fighting men, okay? They were slaves in Egypt. They had gotten free, but then all of a sudden this Egyptian army is coming after them. Why were they really terrified in the final analysis? You can analyze this thing to death, but in the, in, in the end, to me, the reason they were terrified is because they forgot all that God had done for them. Do you remember? Do you know that story? Now, if you don't, it's okay if you do remember, like, Prince of Egypt or 
the old school Charlton Heston movie. Hey, what had happened before then? Moses went, he talked to the Pharaoh, he said, let my people go. Pharaoh wouldn't do it. What happened? There were a series of 10 massive plagues designed by God to convince Pharaoh to let his people go. Do you remember some of them? In fact, Pastor Brian preached a sermon on this and then asked everybody, do you remember all the 10 plagues? <laughs> I was cracking up, I remember, during that message because somebody from the church had, had, had messaged in on the public chat room. They had write, wrote down frogs, lice, darkness, having to homeschool my kids. You know, <laughs> just, I just had to laugh at that one as part of the 10 plagues. But all, all kidding aside, do you remember what the final plague was? It was the Passover where the firstborn in Egypt all died, including the firstborn of Pharaoh himself. That got their attention. And they got freed. Now, by the way, they weren't just set free. They were loaded down with all kinds of valuables. The Bible says that God turned the hearts of the Egyptians favorably towards these people, and they gave them jewelry, gold, all kinds of stuff. And yet, and by the way, they, they had this stuff, <laughs> but did it trigger a memory for them? No. All they could think of is this is it. We're done. By the way, did they have anything to do with generating those miracles that happened? All 10 of them? No. But somehow their memory got super short. So here's my question. How's your memory these days? There was a dear lady in our church for many years. Hannah Smead was her name. She's with the Lord now. But she lived to be 95. And I remember uh, taking her to, you know, on errands and things like that just to help her out. Very godly woman. But every now and then she'd have a senior moment and she'd say this line and she'd say, you know, I have a great memory. It's just short. <laughs> I told her, I said, I'm going to use that line, you know, someday. And trust me, I, I do. <laughs> But you know, it's one thing to forget a name or some detail, like it's, you know, you're just having the classic senior moment. But it's another thing to forget the amazing things that God has done for you and for me. You know, another thing is sometimes we don't forget, but we reinterpret things. Um, great quote I heard once some years ago. L listen to this quote, this is, this is good. The events of our past never change. Only our interpretation of them does. Now think, think about that. Because you see, one of the things that I think our enemy, the devil, seeks to do is to distort our memory of the past. He tries to make sin like really great, like it was really better than it actually was. And he tries to minimize or shove to the side or kind of just twist things about what God has done. So we get into these situations where we're in a crisis and then we have kind of a skewed view of who God is and what he did. So again, I just want to encourage you, when you feel trapped, when you feel afraid, you've got to remember God's power. Remember what the, he has done for you. Okay. Point number three, you need to stand in trust. You know, in verse 13 in this passage, Moses reassures the people. They were terrified, but he reassures them and tells them not to be afraid, to stand still and watch the Lord do what only he can do. Hey, how many of you uh, have trouble standing still? Okay, if it's not you, if you're okay with that, how about your kids? Or no, I know, your grandkids. Don and I have two grandsons, and trust me when I say they are wiggle worms. They have trouble standing still, okay? Now, I have to be honest. I wonder if that's genetic, because I have trouble standing still, too, for different reasons. Some, some of it is, you know, again, for somebody like me to have to stand still and do nothing, for an indefinite period of time, that just is totally counterintuitive, especially when God's word tells me to stand still. It's totally counterintuitive to someone like me 
a classic type A firstborn obsessive compulsion, compulsive son of an army officer leadership type guy. Okay, I have trouble doing that because I have this voice in my head. I don't know. I learned it somewhere. You know, don't just stand there. You know the end of it. Do something, right? Well, there are sometimes that that's really good, but sometimes no. See, when I when I have to stand still. I have trouble, especially when I feel cornered. You ever seen a cat in the corner? <laughs> we have cats in our house. Boy, sometimes they get into it with each other. You ever seen a cat in the corner? Oh, look out. Don't get in the middle of that one, okay? But see, we, we felt that way too, when we feel cornered, when we feel trapped. Because we have what psychologists call a fight or flight syndrome. We're either gonna, you know, uh, we're gonna battle to get our way out of there, or we're gonna run. But to just stand there, why would God say just stand there? You know, the Hebrew word for stand still is very, it, it, it has some nuance to it, and I'm no Hebrew scholar, trust me, okay? But I was looking this up this week, and it, and it says that basically the rough translation of that is to loosen your grip. Sometimes we hold on too tight, don't we? We're holding on so tight that it's like we're going to, wait, no, call it! You, do you know what I'm saying? That isn't what God wants us to do sometimes. He wants us to loosen our grip, to trust him. You know, coming to the Red Sea is just as much a part of God's plan as crossing it. Now let that sink in for a minute. Coming to the Red Sea is just as much a part of God's plan as crossing it. Have you considered that just maybe that God may have allowed you to come to a place where you've come to the end of yourself? You know, you've tried everything you can think of to do in the situation you're in. You've racked your brain to try to figure out a solution, how to change things. Could it be that God is telling you to stand in trust and to, as the Apostle Paul said in Ephesians chapter six, to put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. You know, situations like this help us to learn that it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Final point is this, you need to act in faith. You know, there's a time to wait and there's a time to act. The Lord wanted his people to move on. This is what the Lord showed Moses. But first he told Moses to do something too. He didn't just tell Moses to tell the other people to do something. He had something for Moses to do too. He said this, raise your staff. Stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. Hey, Moses' staff, that walking stick he had, was not a magic wand. <laughs> you know, sometimes we get that impression, like, well, maybe it had some magic to it. No. Moses knew better than just about anyone that neither he nor that walking stick that he used, that staff, a piece of wood, had any kind of miraculous power. But I have to believe that when God called Moses to lift up that staff, that he remembered that time. And if you want to look at it, check it out later in Exodus chapter 4, just a couple chapters earlier. You remember that time how God told him to throw down that staff onto the ground and how that staff, that piece of wood, actually turned into a snake. Then God told him, okay, go ahead and pick it up. And he, and he told him to pick it up by the tail. By the way, there's no snakes in Hawaii, but if you've ever been around snakes, picking up a snake by a tail, bad idea. Okay, just trust me, don't do that, okay? But when Moses did, and by the way, that was an act of faith, wasn't it? <laughs> Picking up a, a snake by the tail the thing transformed immediately back into a piece of wood. 
So you see, Moses acted. He, he acted in faith and trusted God to do what only God can do. How many of you know that there can come a point in your life where you don't need to pray about something anymore? You need to get moving. You know, when God told Moses, hey, raise your staff, lift it up, and stretch out your hand, these were actually pretty simple instructions, basic things to do. But when Moses did that, it resulted in a mighty miracle. In the same way, I personally believe that God often calls us when we're standing at our own kind of Red Sea moment. He calls us to do simple things, basics, and then to trust him to do the rest. My question to you today is, what is God showing you that you need to do right now? If you don't know what to do, here's some ideas. Here's some simple, basic things that you can do, straightforward things that every Christian should do when they don't know what to do. Ready? Okay, read your Bible. <laughs> read your Bible every day, okay? Pray, pray to God. Don't just pray to the air, to the universe. Pray to, pray to our Lord, Jesus Christ. Stay connected with the church. Be in fellowship with people. Zoom or otherwise, stay connected and worship. You do those four basic things, and I guarantee you, God is going to bless that, and he's going to lead and guide you through this time. So at the end of this story, as God ended up parting the Red Sea, that Hollywood moment, as we would kind of imagine it, the Israelites chose to walk through on that dry ground with walls of water to either side of them. They acted in faith. They followed God's directions. They trusted in him to bring them across to the promised land. And even when the Egyptians kind of had that opportunity to charge in at, into that area after them, the Israelites, God's people, kept moving forward. And guess what? God took care of the rest. Or as we would say, the rest is history. Because those walls of water caved in over those Egyptians, and as God had promised, these Egyptians who you see today, you will never see again. And what's amazing about that, actually not that amazing if you think about it, when they got across to the promised land and, those, and, and the sea retor returned to it, it, its state, they just broke forth in song. Spontaneous song in praise to God. As we close today, I have a question for you. Do you feel trapped today? Do you feel afraid? In fact, I wonder, some of you uh, may not have planned to tune into this today, but you did, and maybe, have you considered that maybe God has engineered the circumstances in your life just so that you could get to a place where you turn your life over to God? You know, one day all of us are going to come to the end of our lives, whether we want to accept that or not. And regardless of the circumstances, whether we live a long life and have a gradual kind of passing from here to eternity, or whether our life is cut short in kind of a, you know, like a car wreck or something, you know, some sudden, okay, regardless of that. All of us are going to pass over to the other side at some point. You know, the Israelites went from the shores of Egypt to the brink of the promised land. And in that same way, one day, we're going to pass from this life into eternity. The question then becomes, when your time to cross over comes, will you be ready? You know, Jesus said a number of things to give us assurance about the future this one came to my mind this week. In John chapter 5, verse 24, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. Let's pray. God, we thank you again for your word. And we pray that you would help us, Lord, to apply these truths to our lives. And if you're listening or watching today, 
and you've realized, I need to commit my life to God. I, I need to, or maybe recommit my life to God. I, I want you to do that right now with me in the quietness of your own heart. Pray with me. Dear God, thank you for sending Jesus to die for me. I just ask that you'd forgive me. I ask that you would be my leader, be my Lord, change me, help me to know you. And I pray in Jesus' name. Hey, if you prayed that prayer today, I wanna to encourage you. Would you let one of us know on staff? We wanna encourage you. We have lots of tools and resources. We always give a lot of resources out and we're more than glad to help you in this new walk of faith that you've discovered today. God bless each and every one of you.
never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop. get this opportunity every week to, to take offering and, and communion together, and, and we're going to enter into that time right now. Um, and I'll be the first to admit that, that it, was, it was weird, and it was awkward, and it was uncomfortable for me um, when we would take communion, but we would do it apart. Even right now, looking at empty chairs in front of me, but knowing there's people connected to me online, um, it was, it was a thing where I wanted people to be with me when I did it, right? I wanted to be taking the juice. I wanted to be taking the bread, but I wanted to be around others um, in a large group when I did it. And, and it took me a while to realize um, that I was so focused on the actual act of doing it, um, the motions of doing it, of, of actually doing communion um, that I had somehow disconnected myself from the actual connecting with God uh, and connecting with people around me on a deeper spiritual level. Uh, and, and I know it, it can be hard and weird in these times that we are in right now to, to, to realize that God is in these moments, right? Because sometimes we want that, that juice and maybe we just have a cup of coffee and we want that bread and maybe we have uh, leftovers from the night before. But the reality is this, God is in every moment that we have. Right? God, Jesus' work on the cross, the Holy Spirit is what connects every single one of us in the body of Christ. And that's the blessing that we get to share in right now when we take communion together. And as we go into offering, it's that same concept, that same idea. We get to give back what God has given to us. Something that, that we never really deserved, something that was never really ours, but we're giving it back so that way others can experience the love of God. So that way others can experience the good news so that way they can be a connected and be a part of that family, be a part of that body of Christ. So as you, you gather those, those drinks, those, those coffees or that orange juice or that leftover dinner from the night before, um, 
hold on to that, and we're going to come back together in just a little bit, and I'm going to pray. And, uh, yeah, and we'll partake as a family, one body, under one spirit, under one God. Please pray with me. Lord, thank you for these, these moments that you, that you give us and, and bless us with to be, to be in community together, Lord God. Uh, we thank you for this family that you've blessed us with. And we thank you for, for your work on the cross, Lord God, that, that blood that was shed for our sins, Lord, so we could be in relationship with the Father. We ask that you would continue to bless our time together. And though times may be difficult, Lord God, we know that you are in control, that you are the great healer, that you are all-powerful, Lord God, and you are sovereign. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Please take with me. Okay. I'm going to give us some announcements. What we have coming up here at KCC, we have a new men's Ohana group that's starting Sunday mornings from 7 to 8 a.m. on Zoom. That's going to be beginning, uh, beginning August 23rd, okay? And we have a video for you that's connected to this men's Ohana group, so check it out. Imagine with me for a moment what could be. Imagine a world where men lead in their marriages, where men lead in raising their children, where men lead in protecting those who are weak and oppressed. It is the most important journey you could possibly be on. Is there anything this world needs more than a bold movement of men to step up and be men. When you look across our own lives, we can see that there's a deficit there, and there's a great need for men to rise up and be the men they've been called to be. We're just not going to pull that out of the air. We're going to look at our model and, our model. and the 33 years that Jesus lived on this earth. Men who don't transition well into middle adulthood, they usually fall to the major danger. You find yourself in between a rock and a hard place. If you let this happen, you'll find yourself in manhood hell. There's a lot that you can give a son, but the greatest gift you can give him is the example of integrity and a great name. That's a legacy. So you're not talking complex ethics here, right? Don't touch that tree. That, that's not hard. You see, manhood is imprinted. If you get the young men, you win the war. You get the families, the women, the children, the money, the business, you get everything. Imagine a world where men dominate areas of eternal significance. Next up, Vision Weekend is coming up, and that's exciting. 
Uh, and what we have for that is uh, voting for elders, right? So all voting for elders is going to be done by mail this year. Uh, so look for your letters um, in, in the mail, and you'll be sending in your ballots that way. And thank you so much for participating in the life of our church. Also, please be sure to follow us on Facebook, uh, our, on facebook.com slash Kaimuki Christian Church. All right. And now, if you would join me in our benediction, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Have a great weekend, and God bless you.